Good morning, everyone. Morning. Um, welcome to day three of the virtual San Diego Pain Summit. Um, it is early here in Chicago, but not as early as it is in California. Um, and we'll just kind of get right into it. I am excited to announce um, the, or introduce, not announce, introduce the first speaker for the day, um, Jason Silvernail. Um, Jason has been practicing physical, a practicing physical therapist since 1987, on duty in the United States Army as a career military officer with only with over 25 years of service. Dr. Silvernail has worked with a wide variety of patient populations and settings, including orthopedic sports, chronic pain, amputee, and neurological rehabilitation, as well as strength and conditioning. A clinician and a researcher, he has published clinical commentaries and original research in the medical literature, including the Journal of Orthopedic and Sports Physical Therapy, Manual Therapy, and the Journal of Manual and Manipulative Therapy. And he does have a prominent professional presence online where you can connect with him on Facebook and Twitter. Um, so, and that's actually, I think the first time that Jason and I met was online and then finally in person Absolutely. at the San Diego Summit. That's exactly right. It's a, so, so many great connections are made through through San Diego and what uh, Rajam has done for all of us. So that was awesome. Yeah. It's great to be here. I'm so, I'm so excited to to be with everyone and to talk about and have you listen to some things that I think are really important uh, in managing what we do uh, you know, in the clinic, uh, in the gym, uh, as patients, as providers, and as kind of as human beings. And I think these are, some of these topics are things that... Um, you may not hear about in other venues. You may not hear other people talking about it. And I think um, we have hard conversations and Rajam has provided a space for us to have some hard conversations. There's going to be some hard conversations here and I hope you like them. And I hope that it gives us an opportunity to put things and think about things that maybe we wouldn't have had before. And I look forward to, you know, seeing everybody in the Q and A and, and talking and working through those things together. Awesome. But before we go and do the hard work, do you have anything you'd like to share with us? Um, uh, yeah, I do. I have some, I have something that I think if you, if it's early, it's going to wake you up in the morning. So we talked about difficult conversations. Bear with me and, and work with me. So um, this is a Beretta 92 <laughs> nine millimeter pistol, right? And so safety first, first, we're going to drop our mag. We are going to make sure we're safe. I carried a version of this in Afghanistan and in the Middle East for self-defense in the US Army, right? Now, um, I know some of you might be feeling a certain kind of way when this sort of thing is on camera, right? Uh, it's okay, right? So one of the things that it's important for all of us to remember is that being prepared for things and talking about them doesn't mean that we wanna seek out difficult things. We just need to be prepared. I'm gonna walk you through today uh, some things that will help you be prepared for difficult and challenging situations. It doesn't mean you want to seek them out. It doesn't mean you're excited about them. It doesn't mean that it's always happiness that we're talking about, but we're ready. We are prepared to deal with difficult things. And I think that's an important message for all of us to go, look, I, I have a fire extinguisher in the back of my car. Doesn't mean that I, I drive around with my car starting fire so I can use my fire extinguisher. Same thing with the tools that I'm going to teach you here. Just because you know about how to deal with difficult conversations doesn't mean that you seek them out or that you're looking for conflict. But if it happens, you're ready. Awesome. And with that, we're going we're gonna to roll film and, and learn a lot. And we'll see everyone live in a bit. What is up, San Diego Virtual Pain Summit? I am so excited to be here. My name is Jason Silvernail. We're going to talk about difficult conversations and patient non-compliance. We're going to get into all sorts of really interesting things that I'm hopeful that you will really like and that will give you practical tools that you can apply tomorrow toward making some of these things smoother for both you and for other people. Uh, at the title slide here, you can see all the different little icons of where I am in social media. If you're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, LinkedIn, TikTok, find me. Um, like and share and interact with me and, and let's talk some more about these things. And I, I look forward to hearing your questions and comments in the Q&A at the end. So let's get started with what is probably the most exciting slide. 
the disclaimer slide. So uh, I am here as Dr. Silvernail, not as Colonel Silvernail. So I'm a career uh, military officer in the U.S. Army. So the things that we talk about here, the views expressed are those of me and do not reflect the official policy or position of the Department of the Army, the Department of the Defense, or the U.S. government. That is the disclaimer slide. And then slightly more exciting is the disclosure slide where I tell you I have no financial relationships to disclose. I would really like some financial relationships to, to disclose. Nobody goes into the army to get rich, and that's not, and that's true of me too. So maybe someday I'll have something to disclose, but right now I just don't. So let's jump into it, and I'm going to start off with the bad news. So here's the bad news. Here is that everything is your fault. So the bad news is that noncompliance, in my view, expresses that 100% wrong attitude about patient adherence to plans of care. And adherence is the word I want you to use, and not noncompliance. When patients don't follow through on their program, it's usually your fault, it's not the client's fault. And if you are stuck in difficult interactions with other people, it is usually because you have failed to confront issues, failed to maintain boundaries, and failed to set appropriate expectations. And that's the bad news, is that everything I'm talking about today is your fault. And when I say you, I mean me. It's my fault too when I'm there. But the good news is, everything is also your responsibility. That's the beauty of accountability. So learning to approach care adherence for your clients and patients through their view restores your connection to the, uh, the pleasure and the joy of serving others instead of bossing them around. Uh, you can improve adherence to your plan by demonstrating some key patient-centered behaviors that I will list out for you and that you can apply tomorrow and that are in fact teachable. And you can learn to proactively manage difficult interactions with other people to include patients, clients, colleagues, supervisors, and even your friends and family to, in order to improve both your experience and theirs. And again, I will give you practical tools that you can apply tomorrow that will help you with this. So really what I want to talk about today is I want to talk about difficult conversations. And that's really what this discussion is like. There's a book cover on the on the. Um, screen there for you to look at. And uh, so I read this book many years ago, and I really enjoyed it. Um, of all the things that I've read and, and training that I've had about interacting with people and dealing with difficulty, um, I think this is a really good, easy read, and it's highly recommended. So why are we having this talk? Why am I delivering this talk to you? I'll tell you why. Because people tell me often, that they have patients or clients who argue or disagree about treatments. They have colleagues that are uncooperative or difficult or angry at work. The uh, clinicians tell me they're frustrated that patients don't follow through on the treatment plans. And sometimes they've even said they don't feel the patients want to get better if they don't follow directions. This is one thing I've heard a lot. I can't want to get better more than you do, or I can't want it more than you do, or worse that effect, right? So that's very frustrating for people. And I want to help you sort this out. I want to work, help people sort these kinds of issues out. So in order to do that, we really need to just talk about difficult conversations. And that's what we'll do today. So the first thing that I want to talk about when we get to this is that people feel that there's sort of professional boundary concern. They say, oh, you know, what about my scope of practice? This isn't my job. You know, I'm not trained for this. This sounds like some psychology stuff. You know, I'm not a psychologist or a counselor. You know, I'm not here to walk people through that kind of stuff. I'm just here to do rehab or massage or fitness or whatever, right? Well, here's the thing. So working with other people and developing a relationship based on mutual respect, where you are respecting each other's boundaries and successfully working together to achieve the goal, whatever that goal is, is absolutely your scope of practice, no matter what your job is. That is, that is our whole job. So when, when we think about that's not my job to talk to people, please best believe it most certainly is your job as it is mine. So we've got to work with people and find ways to help uh, get along cooperatively and, and, and be able to accomplish things regardless of what your background is, rehabilitation or medicine or fitness or massage or whatever it is, right? Some things people say like, I, I'm not trained about how to do this. I said, well, you know, maybe not a lot. But a lot of these things are basic and they're about human interaction and they're teachable. So we're, I'm not going to teach you today how to make a psychiatric or psychological diagnosis. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to teach you how to provide behavioral health care to someone with a psychiatric or psychological diagnosis, right? That's not what this is about, right? This is about interacting with people and helping them adhere to programs that, that, would, that will help them get better and how you can proactively manage your behavior when you interact with other people, right? 
So the question then comes, okay, if the boundary is not such an issue, like why should we listen to you? You're, you're not a psychologist. Well, you're right. I'm not a psychologist. I'm not a life coach either. I'm not in the motivational interviewing network of trainers. Uh, but what I can do is tell you a little bit about what my background is and how I think it can help. So I've been in medicine for 20 years. Uh, I'm a career military officer. I've been in the military for almost 30 years. And a big part of my job is dealing with interpersonal interaction problems, helping people gel together as a team and accomplish goals, and diffusing and handling interpersonal conflict is a big part of my job. And it, it is on a recurrent basis. So I think I'm a good person to offer you some feedback and advice in this area. And I'm, not, I'm gonna focus away from sort of big picture theoretical things, and I'm gonna focus directly on actionable skills and behaviors that you can put into practice tomorrow to make this easier, both for yourself and for others. So I wanna start by talking about just this term non-compliance, right? So um, as I talked about before, I really don't like the word non-compliance, and I'm hoping to convince you today that that's the wrong word for you to use if you're still using it. So non-compliance sounds like a law enforcement term, right? Now, it sounds like something a law enforcement officer would reference when they're interacting with someone else, right? They want compliance, right? Here's the deal. If we're in a helping profession, if we're in a service profession, and I'm guessing you're in one of the two, maybe even both, you're not looking for compliance. You're looking for cooperation. And the only way to get cooperation is to move past this idea that I boss you around and move toward the idea of we need to work together and collaborate to build something that will work. Right? So the non-compliance mindset is the first thing that we need to talk about uh, and get rid of. So when we think about issues about non-compliance and, and coming together, really what we're thinking about is following instructions. And I know what you might be thinking, isn't it easy to do the right thing? Don't we just have to tell people what the right answer is or what the right thing to do and won't they just do it on their own? Well, it turns out a little bit more complicated than that. The question for us is why don't our clients or patients do what we ask them to do? And, and so I think some people say, well, you, what you really need to do is you need to create a, a presentation about how to deal with difficult patients. Sometimes clinicians will say this to me, right? You know, these patients are difficult and they don't do, they don't follow instructions and they don't do their home, home program. They don't implement their exercise programs. They don't follow along with their conditioning program. And I don't know how to deal with them. You need to, you need to teach people about how to deal with difficult patients. I'm kind of listening to this as people talk to me about it. And, and I thought maybe I could do but then I thought, no, that's not the right thing. Really what they wanted me to do is create this presentation, how to deal with patients when you are difficult. Because if you think that the people, the people you deal with, your clients and patients, often are deliberately being difficult and uncooperative, I have news for you. You are the problem, not them. Right? So I really thought about how to, how to create a presentation that says how to deal with patients when you're difficult because that's really what this is about. And we need to be able to move past that concept and toward a more cooperative partnership with our patients and clients. So when I think about why people don't do what we ask them to do, I think it's mostly our fault, in fact. It's usually not their fault at all, it's mostly ours. And I think about, when I think about why they don't follow through on a program, I think about four themes of reasons why that doesn't happen. Now, I don't mean that these are four very specific reasons. Don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that in all the world there are no other reasons but these four. I'm saying that these are themes or topic areas that we might consider for our patients and clients. So maybe they didn't follow through because your advice didn't help or it wasn't relevant to their problem. Maybe it wasn't feasible for them in their life. Or, and this is very rare, they want to really continue in the, in the patient role. We'll talk about things like malingering and secondary gain in just a few minutes. So the first is, your advice didn't help, right? So when a patient comes back to me and I find that they are not any better, that is, this is what I think about. And you know, if I gave them advice and they tried to, to implement it and it didn't work, why would they continue doing it? Only a crazy person would continue to do what wasn't working. Right? So when they come back and they report that they're not any better, the first thing I think about is the idea of subjective versus objective improvement. Many times patients will come back to me and say they don't feel like they're any better. 
but then their objective measures, their function, their movement, their self-report score is actually quite a bit better than the last time I saw them. And so this is an opportunity for me to help people see and, and show them the improvement that they've made that they may not be able to see. So that's the first one. So generally, now in my, my line of work is you know physical rehabilitation. So in conservative and muscular skeletal care, most conditions get better with time and evidence-based treatment. So if it's not getting better, my first thought is maybe I have a diagnosis problem. Maybe I'm working at the wrong thing to try to fix. Somebody came in with shoulder pain and we gave them some really good evidence-based shoulder rehabilitation and they're not any better. One of the first things that's in my mind is maybe this isn't a shoulder problem. Maybe it's a problem somewhere else. This, maybe this is referred pain from their neck, which is actually quite common, right? So maybe I missed the diagnosis, that's one. And the other is maybe I have a dosing problem. Maybe what I gave them was appropriate, I just didn't give them enough of a dose to be successful. I, maybe I overdosed them and they got a little worse, or maybe I underdosed them and they're not doing enough load or activity in order to improve. And so those are some of the things I think about when patients come back to me and say that my advice didn't help or they're not improving. But any patient or any of us who's doing something and it isn't meeting our goals, will stop doing that thing. And that's just a natural thing. So the first theme is your advice didn't help. The second theme is maybe the advice wasn't relevant to them. It needs to fit the patient goals. It, you, we have to make sure that what the patient thinks is wrong and what I think is wrong line up. It doesn't have to be exact, but it has to be pretty close. We'll talk a little bit about the chief complaint. And I think it's important for all of us to think. Our patients and clients are not going to go home and spend their own personal time doing things that we think are important. They're only going to be doing things that they think are important. And that's an important mental step for us to make. Another thing is our advice wasn't feasible, right? So maybe it wasn't possible for them to execute our advice. They have environmental challenges or an ability to, to actually follow through on the program. So if a patient or client lives in a area that is not physically safe for them, giving them a walking program, if they have no place to walk or no place to walk that is safe, that doesn't make much sense. That's, an, that's a program that's not feasible, right? Uh, giving someone a weight training based rehabilitation program. Now, strength exercises are very popular right now to uh, prescribe for muscular skeletal problems. And I think they're generally pretty evidence-based and a good idea. But sometimes the, the prescriptions given are you know, based on gym-based weight training routines. And unless we're dealing with a small percentage of our patients who are regular gym goers and like going to the gym and lifting, then it's, chances are that it's not a prescription that's going to be feasible for that person. One way to assess this is to have them do whatever the home program is uh, in the clinic with you. Now, you can't always do that for every plan that you build, but for when you can, it allows you to determine whether or not the exercise program is feasible for the patient to execute and whether it actually um, helps them or moves them forward with their disorder, right? And so your advice needs to be feasible for the patient. And if it's not, then that's probably our fault, right? And the last is the patient might want to maintain the patient role. This is the concept of malingering or secondary gain. Now look, let's put to bed some of these concepts and ideas. Let's have some real talk about secondary gain and malingering and all that stuff right now, you and me. So I practice in the Department of Defense, and I have for the last 20 years. And in the Department of Defense, people get monetary benefit for being assigned a percentage of disability, and they get relief from job requirements if I sign a work excusal form and I sign in the doctor block, right? Now, that's an environment in which you would think people are motivated to maybe complain a little more than they should in order to get out of something or to get some money. Maybe some people think that that's the case. But I have to tell you, in 20 years of, of over 20 years of medical practice in the Department of Defense, I have maybe seen this three times, maybe. And the third one I'm not even sure of, right? It is not just rare, it's exceedingly rare. It's also impossible to reliably spot. And I don't want to put myself 
in the role of trying to figure out whether someone has a real problem or not, right? We'll talk about that a little bit more in the future, but that's not the appropriate role for me to have in the clinic. I'm trying to do my best for every patient that comes to see me, and if I'm not able to help them, my responsibility is to move them on to another option, right? But people who want to maintain the patient role are exceedingly rare in our system. So they might be rare, but then it brings up this question of what about secondary gain? Now here, some clinicians talk about this a lot, and I'm gonna be straight with you. I have never heard a clinician talk a lot about secondary gain who was not also angry at their patients, unhappy, and burnt out at work. And so when I hear this from a clinician, it's usually not a good sign. So here's what secondary gain means if you look it up somewhere, right? You can see the definition on the screen there. So let's talk about some examples of secondary gain. They might be monetary compensation, right, through the legal system or government benefits or corporate compensation, something like that. You might be, they might be relief from social or work responsibilities, like a, like a sick slip or work excusal. There might be some interpersonal regard or sympathy that they might trying to be gathered uh, as an illness sufferer, or they might derive a sense of control by directing the actions of others through, the, through medical treatment. Now, all of these are what you will find if you were to look up what secondary gain is about. So it's worth asking ourselves, what are you really getting? When we talk about gain, what are we really gaining here? Are we talking about money? The monetary compensation people get obviously varies based on what country they're in, what corporation they work for, or what their setting is. Does any of us think that that is a lot of money? I encourage you to look that up and do your own research. So the monetary compensation for disability and illness almost no matter where you go, is not that much money. Folks, it's peanuts, right? It's peanuts. Nobody is sitting back getting rich on disability compensation. How about relief from responsibilities, right? So if you don't have to go to work, isn't that a good thing? Isn't it good that you, that you are relieved from work? Isn't that a secondary gain factor? Well, you get hardly any of that from a disability claim. You're just replacing your work with medical visits and paperwork. That doesn't sound like a good deal. How about sympathy? Are we really are people who are sick really getting a lot of sympathy from other people? I don't think they're getting sympathy. Sometimes they might get pity, and that doesn't feel good. So if you know or you yourself have had a serious illness or injury and, and been in that role, you know that is not a fun place to be, right? How about this idea about controlling other people through the medical system? Well, I gotta tell you, like everybody everybody else in the medical system. I get paid for going to work and taking care of people. Like there's no special power involved in asking me to do my job, right? So when we really look at this idea of secondary gain, we pull it apart. There's really not a whole lot of gain to be had, is there, right? So it's also important to realize secondary gain, that's only half the equation. There's a whole other half of the equation. And what is that? It's primary loss. We all, we're all good about talking about secondary gain. What about the primary losses? What do you lose if you are chronically sick or injured, right? Well, you lose your income or family responsibility. You lose your freedom from having to coordinate visits and paperwork and to, you know, fill out all this paperwork and argue with somebody, whether it's a corporation or a government agency, to prove that you are really sick and injured in order to be able to follow through and get the care you need. That's a lot of fun, right? You get to lose your independent role in family and society. And often you lose the sense of appreciation or dignity for others for the role that you serve for them as somebody who is, is serving and helping other people. Those sound like some pretty heavy losses for not very much gain, right? And so because of that, I'm going to just propose you a trade. Let's, let's make a trade, shall we? We are going to trade one thing for another. We are going to trade our secondary gains for our primary losses. Now let's put them up on the screen right now. You can see it right now. And let's look at what you lose and what you gain. And I want you to tell me if you think this is a good trade. If you lose your primary income and responsibility, your independent role, appreciation from others, respect and dignity for doing what you do, and your freedom to pursue your life on your own terms, you're gonna give all that up for the peanuts amount of disability or compensation money 
and the joy of coordinating multiple medical visits and filling out all this paperwork to prove to other people that you're sick, losing the role that you have in your family and society, uh, loss of control of your own life. That's what you have to give up. Who would make that trade? Would you make that trade? I know I wouldn't. It is a, it is an, it is a terrible trade. But it's not just that it's a bad trade. There's more. Secondary gain is just another term for blaming the patient. So please don't do it. And what's worse is that secondary gain actually does something else independent of patients. Secondary gain, the concept, is a crutch for us in the medical system. We didn't invent it for the patients. We invented it for ourselves to make ourselves feel better, to avoid facing our own failures to help other people. The question is, who benefits from secondary gain? We do. That's what secondary gain is about. It's about making us feel better in medicine. And, and it is therefore toxic and damaging to our relationship and care for patients. It actually puts us in the situation of having to, or feeling like we need to play Nancy Drew and the Hardy Boys, searching out and being an investigator to try to see who's got real problem and who doesn't. Because if we can tell ourselves this person doesn't have a real problem, Therefore, we can feel better for our inability to help them, right? Secondary gain is a crutch for us. So here's our big picture four themes of people who have difficulty following through with your instructions or plan. And here's the concepts of why. Your advice didn't help. It wasn't relevant. It wasn't feasible. Were those very few people who want to continue in the patient role? And uh, we've talked a lot about secondary gain. We talked about primary laws. We talked about non-compliance. We talked about malingering. Um, I hope you'll think carefully about this, and I hope that, that some of this resonates with you. Because really, it's easier for people to adhere if you're working on a goal that they value and that you are seeing the problem through their point of view. And if the plan that you've put to, in place is actually feasible for them personally. But sometimes, despite everyone's best efforts, there's some conflict. Now, who might you have conflict with? It might be with your clients or patients. It might be with work colleagues or supervisors. Or it might be other people, maybe even your family and friends. And let's talk to you uh, today about a framework you can use to enter a difficult conversation and improve your experience and the people that you're in it with. Right? And so the four-step system works like this. Number one, you have to understand your own mental posture when you enter a difficult conversation. Number two, you have to learn to move towards the problem rather than away from it. Number three is you have to learn to recognize and respond to emotions that make difficult conversations hard. And you've got to find a way to, to pivot to moving forward together with that person. So let's talk for a minute about your mental posture. I've got a, I've got a quote up on the screen that, um, you know, that I used many years ago that people seem to like, and I'm going to repeat it here. When I freed myself from the responsibility for the outcome of the clinical encounter, something interesting happened. I freed my patients from blame also. So your mental posture as you enter is that of someone who is a help, who is here to be a helper, right? Whether you are in rehabilitation or massage or fitness or whatever your service business is, right? Like you could be making cinnamon rolls at the mall and your mental posture needs to be, I'm here to help someone, right? Now, when you put yourself in the right mental frame of mind, the whole rest of the conversation has the potential to go much better for you. And when you think about your mental posture, you think about what your job is. Like if you get into a conflict with someone at work, it's worth thinking about. What is your, what's your job here? Is it to be right? Is it to heal someone? Is it to not let that person get away with doing whatever it is they're doing? Is it to have your way? I don't think your job is any of those things, right? Your mental posture and your job is to put yourself in the role of being in service or help to someone else. And it's that mental posture, it's that sense of job role that you have when you enter the conversation that will make the rest of it go much more smoothly. Because really, it's not just up to me whether someone gets better or not. If I think about a positive clinical outcome, it's really an equation, right? And I've got the variables for the equation on the screen there. Now, a positive clinical outcome has to do with luck, the genetics of the patient, the social determinants of health. What do I mean by social determinants of health? 
uh, you know, someone's socioeconomic background or where they live and the, the social or cultural things that affect their health, right? Their environment, the nature of their disorder or problem, the actions the patient takes, and the action I take. So wait a second. It's a lot of variables. And I'm only responsible for one of those variables. Here's the deal. I'm not actually in charge of making people better. I'm not in charge of that. I'm in charge of making my variable of clinical care absolutely as good as it can be. And the other variables are outside my control, right? And our mental posture needs to reflect that as we enter a conversation with people. The second thing I want you to think about is I want you to think about moving towards the problem. Now, if you've got a military background, you might be familiar with this concept or idea. Um, is that the only way out of this difficult situation is through. Turning around and going back, not an option. Avoidance, not helpful. We need to learn to move toward the problem by pushing through the difficulty that we have with someone and doing it in a way that will improve our experience and theirs. So I, I need you to know it's natural when conversations get difficult for people to want to pull back or avoid something. That is a natural response to a difficult conversation. Unfortunately, it tends to perpetuate the cycle back and forth of difficulty and doesn't solve the problem, right? So patients or clients who are upset, they are used to people pulling away from them, right? They're used to people not listening and pulling away. And those few people that you run into in life who are genuinely difficult, and there are some of those people out there, they count on your reluctance to engage as a way to keep you from enforcing and observing important boundaries with them. And so for all of these reasons, one of our first goals when we sense difficulty is to move towards the problem rather than away. So one of the expressions we have in, in self-defense is if you can make them talk, you can make them walk, right? Now the goal in self-defense is for things to not turn physical, right? So if I end up getting into a fight with someone, that's not a good thing for my ability to defend myself. That's a bad thing, right? I, I have, at some level, I have failed if I have to have a physical confrontation. My goal is to always avoid that, right? So if I can sense that we're getting close to that, that physical part, if I can sense that and I can keep talking and I can keep the person that I'm worried about talking to me, the chances are good that we can resolve it verbally and we can, and he can walk. In other words, we can, we can end the encounter without it getting physical. Now, what does that have to do with what you do in the clinic or in the gym, right? Well, if you can, if you can engage with someone and talk and interact with them and move towards them, chances are good that things will not get worse in some other way, uh, you know, a complaint or anything like that, right? You want to move towards the problem and stay engaged with someone during this difficult conversation. Now, I know that is not what your typical intuition will be. And we need to learn, you need to learn to push through that intuition and move towards the problem. So the question for us is, what is it about a conversation that makes it difficult, right? Well, it's the presence of emotions. Emotions make conversations hard, right? So in a medical context, seeing someone else in pain is not easy. It's easy when you have emotions around to take things personally. And I want you to know that meaning and emphasis is more important than exact words. And when we have high stakes and health and medical care are high stakes, there's a sense of high anxiety and interactions too. And it's the presence of these difficult emotions that make conversations hard. I'm gonna teach you a, a system to respond to emotions in a way that will help you understand yourself and the other person and help you negotiate this in a much more successful way. And the system I'm gonna teach you is called A-N-L-O-S. The A-N is, is, comes first, it's acknowledge or apologize. Name the emotion you see. And those, th that first initial movement, that A-N, it helps lower the temperature and helps, hear, helps people feel heard. And then you move on to legitimization, openness, and support. And I have some example phrases that help you understand what these terms mean. So we're gonna go into detail on the ANLOS system right now, and I'm gonna work you through a couple of examples, and then we're gonna show common uh, pitfalls and common uh, best practices in just a minute. 
So you enter into a difficult conversation. Your first response should be A-N. The A is acknowledge and apologize. Acknowledgement means to acknowledge the situation is difficult or acknowledge the person as they are. That helps them feel heard and it lowers the temperature. You can sometimes also apologize. Now you don't want to apologize or take responsibility for something that's not your responsibility to take, but you can apologize for their experience or for the situation in a way that doesn't put yourself on the line and make it personal for you. So that's what acknowledge and apologize is, that's A. And then is N, and the N is for naming. We are gonna name the emotion that you see. By naming the emotion that you see, you are directly talking about what isn't being said. In difficult conversations, people talk about everything but the emotions that they're feeling. And this process of naming helps you cut right to the center of the issue. Now, I think the best example I can think of of AN is I saw a video uh, many years ago. Now, I, I don't have children, but this this video is a, of a mother and, and, a, and her son, and the son is like maybe two years old, and he's clutching a Spider-Man doll, and they're having an argument about going to school. And that really resonated with me because I was two years old, and I had a Spider-Man doll, and I did not want to go to school either. And the video went like this. The child is holding onto the doll really, really hard, and he's yelling at his mom, I want Spider-Man. And the mother said, now come on, Billy, it's time for school, we gotta get ready. And then he would yell over top of her, I want Spider-Man. And she would say, no, come on, Billy, we gotta put the doll away and it's time for you to go to school. And he would just yell, I want Spider-Man over and over and over, right? Clearly, we're not getting anywhere, right? And then after about three or four of those, the mother kind of gets quiet. And then she leans in and she says loudly, not yelling, but loudly, you want Spider-Man, really? In that kind of forceful tone to her son. And, and, the, and the child goes, yeah. And then all of a sudden, the whole rest of the encounter went smoothly. Now I thought, oh my gosh, what a perfect example of acknowledge and name, right? So by, by talking back to the child about what he wanted, she was helping him feel heard. And when people feel heard, the temperature comes down in the interaction, right? People often are loud or more persistent or more boundary crossing if they feel that you're not listening to them. And that's what's, that, that happens. If you're in the other room and you say something to your spouse or partner and they can't hear you, the natural thing is to say something louder, right? And if you're not heard, being loud is common. But the response of AN helps lower the temperature and helps the other party feel heard. And that sets the stage for the next movement, which is LOS, legitimization, openness, and support. Legitimization helps express that you are validating or affirming that the emotion that the other person feels is a normal and reasonable emotion in this situation, right? And openness shows that you're not afraid to hear more and discuss it. And support commits to working together to find a solution together instead of being at odds with each other. And that LOS is how you go from validating and helping people feel heard to actually solving uh, the, the shared problem you have together. And when you move forward together, we need to you know, return to a baseline interaction. We need to tackle problems that they value through their perspective and kind of leverage some of their own internal motivations. These are ways to, to move forward together in a therapeutic context. So when it comes to difficult conversations, we talked about four steps. We talked about understanding your own mental posture to moving towards the problem. We talked about responding to the emotions that you see with the AN and LOS. And we, I talked about moving forward. And gosh, it really seems easy, doesn't it? Here's some examples that, I, that, you've, that you've got. You can see some of the phrases. Here's some different ones. Sorry, this is so difficult. It seems frustrating. See, we named the emotion. I don't blame you for feeling that way. Again, we're validating that emotion in this person. Let's work it out. We're in this together, right? Here's, another, here's an example of a longer term AN and LOS. Look, I'm... Hang on, I, I hear you. I'm sorry this isn't working out so far. So do you see my hands are up? I'm leaning forward. You know, I have like a, a nice open and non-confrontational posture. I'm sorry this isn't working out so far. It seems like you're feeling frustrated. Is that right? Look, I, I'd be pretty frustrated too if I experienced what you just did. I, I wanna know what you think I can do differently here. I, I wanna work together on this and, and I promise you I'll do my part to solve this problem. That's an example of AN. Gosh, 
sounds easy when I do it that way, right? Doesn't it seem so simple when it's all on the screen? But of course you know, when you go to apply it in real life, it can get complicated. So let's talk about how to, how to make this work. So first of all, there's some pitfalls in responding, some things I want you to not do, right? I don't want you to respond to literal meanings and argue the details. And I don't want you to take it personally or provide a knee-jerk validation or pandering for inappropriate things. And I'll talk about all those things. These are pitfalls, things I don't want you to do. The first one is I, don't, I want you to not respond to the literal meaning of everything that is said, right? So the best example of this is the 10 out of 10 pain example, right? So some patients will say, oh yeah, the pain is 10 out of 10. Can't, can't be worse, right? And they say it to you and they're... Um, they don't seem like they're in any distress as they are explaining to you that they have 10 out of 10 pain. Now, some clinicians, they'll respond to that literally, and they'll just become difficult about it. Well, if it's a 10 out of 10, it sounds like you have a major broken bone. We better take you to the emergency department, right? That's not helpful. That's a focus on the literal meanings. Remember I used the example before. If you call out to your spouse or partner in one room and they can't hear you, it's natural to speak louder to try to reach them. When a patient tells me they have 10 out of 10 pain, what I'm hearing from them is they are not being heard by the medical system. And we are not meeting their needs. And so I don't focus on the literal meaning of 10 out of 10. I use that as an opportunity uh, to understand the meaning behind what they say. Small errors of fact in emotional language, and remember, emotions are what makes conversations hard, are normal, right? It's also important that we not argue the details what did or didn't happen immediately before the conflict, and who said what to whom, when. It can be tempting to dive into this and pull this apart and have an autopsy about who did what to whom, when. But I have to tell you, that never results in coming together and solving the problem. That's about blame. And blame, although as attractive as it might be, isn't useful in solving problems, right? The accuracy of these small facts isn't critical to solving a problem. So we want to not argue the details or respond to literal meanings. You also want to not take it personally. We talked before about understanding what your mental posture or role is when you face a difficult conversation. Realize this isn't about you. The difficult conversation is about them and you and your role. And your role as a provider of a service is in the helping role. Whether you are a personal trainer massage therapist or a doctor of physical therapy or a sports medicine physician, whoever you are, your role is to help, right? Not to have a conflict with somebody else. It's not about you personally. And I want you to make sure that you're not pandering. What do I mean by pandering? Pandering is validating or approving grossly inaccurate or non-factual ideas, right? So you shouldn't validate a grossly inaccurate assessment without an appropriate follow-up. Right? So by acknowledging or apologizing, remember that's the A in AN, you don't want to validate or approve inappropriate behavior or something that is not correct, especially when it comes to boundary crossing behavior. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. So prevention of a problem is always better than having to deal with it. Right. So heading off difficulty is better than managing it. By communicating well, observing and asking questions and building an appropriate open relationship, we can prevent conversations from being difficult in the first place. So the first thing to do when it comes to heading off difficulty is to manage expectations. Now our clients and patients come to us with expectations about what's gonna happen under our care. Here's an idea, maybe ask them what they are, right? You can also check progress and change, and then we'll talk, and then we will have a serious talk about boundaries and, and unreasonableness of expectations. So asking is first. So what are you hoping to get out of this? therapy or training or whatever. What kinds of things do you see yourself doing? What's the main thing you think we need to work on? This is my way of helping establish what the expectations are as we get started up front, right? And not only up front, I want to check progress periodically. I want to make sure, hey, are we on the track, right track here? Is there anything you'd like us to work on that we haven't? Is there anything we're doing you don't think is valuable? These are ways that I have to assess someone's expectations and make sure that the reality and the expectation are as close as possible, right? Often difficult conversations and disappointment are provoked by a difference between expectation and reality, right? And boundaries. It's important to remember, you are not responsible for meeting unreasonable expectations. 
and you know best in your line of work what reasonable expectations for that encounter are. You are not responsible for meeting someone else's unreasonable expectation. And don't accept words and actions that cross clear boundaries, like disrespect, failure to meet responsibilities on the, the, the patient's or client side, or physical violence, patient versus clinician. Now, many years ago, I, I, I became the chief of the physical, large physical therapy clinic and asked the staff about uh, what their expectations were and how things were going where we were. One of their concerns that they identified was workplace violence. And I heard this and I thought, oh my goodness, what, what's going on in this clinic that we're being violent toward each other? And so as I sat down and talked with them, I found that it wasn't the staff they were worried about. It was patients and their families. There was often physical violence happening. Now, let's be clear about what I mean. There were patients and families who were poking chests with fingers, grabbing arms, pushing. I wish I were kidding, right? What do you call it when someone touches you without your permission? That's assault, okay? And so if you want, we can talk a little bit in the Q&A about the sort of things that we did to help fix that problem, right? But physical violence and, and assault boundary crossing is definitely something we need to, to hold the line on. So pro, being proactive and managing expectations is always better than dealing with the conflict when you get there. So let's review what we talked about today. We talked a, little, a lot about adherence. We talked about the non-compliance mindset. We talked about this secondary gain thing. And let's put that to bed for, for real and forever, shall we? We also talked about ways to address someone's concerns through their lens and being relevant and feasible to them to help them adhere. We talked about approaching difficult conversations, understanding expectations, checking and monitoring progress. We also talked about how to respond to a difficult conversation when it happens, how to understand your own mental posture, how to move toward the problem, how to respond to emotions with A-N-L-O-S, and how to move forward uh, together to solve problems and improve both your experience and theirs. So today we talked about difficult conversations and uh, patient noncompliance. I am so excited to be able to talk to you. I look forward to your great questions in the Q&A. Uh, and so uh, we'll see you in just a minute. Bye-bye. You did it first. I tell you what, I say the best things when I'm on mute. <laughs> really, so moving into the questions. Um, <laughs> I was going to say, thank you for that great talk. Um, I won't lie, when I saw noncompliance in the title, I'm like, I wonder where he's going to go with this, because that's a term that I, I kind of hate myself. Um, Me too. But I'm really excited that it went where I thought it was going to go. Um, I'm glad. Enough about me and my thoughts. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and bring up some of the questions. Um, I, mean, I think this is more of a comment than a question. So as you gain skills in difficult conversations, you don't have to seek them out. Your colleagues who are aware of you will try to send plenty of people your way. Any yeah. That? No, I think that's true. But I think, look, I feel like some of these skills are skills that everyone should have at some level, right? So one of the things you can't do is like in your workspace, wherever that is, or whatever your job is, whether it's your family or your clinic or whatever, you can't be the only person who is capable of handling a difficult interaction with someone else. That is not, that is not a reasonable expectation, right? So everybody needs some of these skills. And I really have tried to like leave a lot of the theory and conceptual kind of things behind and just focus on some actionable steps that people can do. And so I'm hopeful that this was helpful in that regard. And possibly the start of a new dance craze, which we may cover in a bit. Um, okay. <laughs> Um, what would your suggestions be for handling a patient who may be malingering because they enjoy the social aspect of attending medical appointments? This mm. patient did not have family and did not work. Okay. Well, so here's kind of how I look at this thing. So, like, I have no idea what people's motivations are for doing what they do, and neither do you. So the question is not how do I feel about what I think they're doing? The question is, what am I going to do? What is my role here? And for me, I'm trying to do the best I can on my variable of helping other people get better. And once I have gone as far as I can go and I can't help someone anymore, it's time to move that person on. And that has nothing to do with them. It has everything to do with me and what I've done and, and, and a situation where I've taken someone as far as I can take them. It sounds like 
therapy is over for that person. And so you need to move that person on, not because you think they're malingering, just because it, that's the phase of the recovery that we're in, right? And so I think, you know, um, we don't have to try to figure out why other people do what they do or try to play Nancy Drew and the Hardy Boys about people's uh, motivations and behaviors, right? And so those are mystery books a long time ago if you're too young to know who those people are. My wife always says, you always use these old man examples. Gosh, she's right about that too. Anyway, so um, that's kind of what I want you to do. I want you to focus on your part of this interaction, right? So regardless of what somebody else does or does not do, my job is to maximize that variable of clinical care. And once we're there, it's time to move on. And that's something that's going to be good for you and good for your patients as well. Yes. And if if I could ask your thoughts on something else along that, yeah. that pain is like, so if, if we're thinking, and, and I have to apologize, there was like a little bit more like explanation after that. We're still, I'm still getting the chat down. Um, yeah, yeah, I got it. But, but that maybe, um, right. So like as physical therapists, right, we have some of that, you know, we're talking with people, we're dealing with people. Um, and also if we're their only support system that it might be, that's outside of our scope, being their entire support system. Um, and, it's and outside maybe, of everybody's scope in medicine, right? That's right. not that's not a medical care scope, right? That's not what we're here to do in medicine, right? Right. And part of like the bigger picture, right, with getting those social issues and social support yep. necessary um, and kind of bringing in like the rest of, you know, you can consider interprofessional or team um, to help people get the resources they need. Because I know I like part of your heart wants to do that. It's like, oh, you need help. I want to help. And also, yeah, I can't do that help. Um, yeah. So, okay. So yes. Yeah, so moving on from that point in their recovery and also again, perhaps moving to their next, their next um, place for assistance. Yeah. I would just say like even putting our mind in this space is not useful or healthy, right? It's not, I don't think it's helpful for me to like come up with all the reasons why I think somebody is, is here for the social aspects of therapy. Like that's mental time and space that is not useful to me. Ha and, and it's not helpful in my interaction with the person either, right? So it's like, hey, look, you know, we've done everything we can. I've taken you as far as I can take you here with therapy. And it's now time to kind of transition to self-management. And that's something that we have a responsibility to do in medicine regardless of how we think the what the, we think the person is doing here what all, all those all, all that stuff it's just it's just irrelevant right and it also has the potential to rupture um the 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 therapeutic alliance that i have with the patient when i try to put myself in this situation so so even if you if you find yourself listing out all the reasons you think someone is here for bad reasons you're already in a bad place right you, you it's a good time to recognize that and say, oh, this is not a useful place for me to be as, a, as someone who's here to help and to be in service to others. This is not a healthy place for me to be. I need to turn around and go back. Yeah, I love that. And you said something, and I think I'm not going to get it quite right, but right, like the whole goal of, well, hopefully healthcare in general, but certainly physical therapy is getting them to that point of independence, right? So where they yeah. can go and do the things that they need to do, um, even if they're not perfect. And I wonder how much that is or isn't a part of, of a lot of our training um, is like, so, so when are people done? Because I think at least here in the States, just Sarah's opinion, um, is that very often it's more based on like, well, your insurance visits are up for the year, um, right? So like finding that spot and aiming for that target of, how do you feel about not seeing me on a regular basis? Um, and what are the steps we need to take to, to maybe get you there? Yeah, no, I think that transition is hugely important. I think you're you're a hundred percent right. You're exactly spot on. And so I think regardless of where you go, like you know, one way to look at medicine is like, can everyone have all that they want? No, it doesn't make a difference where you live. It doesn't make a difference what your medical care situation is, right? Uh, you know, in my time in the military, I've, I've, I work with many senior military officers from other countries' militaries. Everybody's medical system has the same problem. Everyone's medical system has the same problem, right? We, we, we are all running out of money and we are all struggling with ways to provide the best care we can with what we have, 
right? And so that doesn't change if you're in you know, Norway or the US or the UK, we, the, the problems are the same. The question is, how do we solve them? And a big part of it for us, regardless of the, the, the you know, whether whether you're in, in physical therapy or you know, sports medicine or massage or whatever, we have to get to that point where we're moving people to that self-management step. And that you're right, that should be independent of, you know, what some of the other things are. It needs to be solely focused on a clinical and self-management goal. Absolutely. And that, it's funny. So that takes me back to another time where um, you were, um, I think, here in Chicago and showed me the best infographic ever about like not being able to outrun a bad diet and how like taking care of ourselves. Um, if we spent more, I don't know, effort, time, money on yeah. on figuring out like what is healthy and and what yeah. what can I be doing as opposed yeah. to just let's get fixed and send you back to wherever you were. Yeah, awesome. So the, it, I know the infographic you mean. It's from the Bipartisan Policy Center, uh, and you you can look it up. And um, I've I've uh, got it up on Twitter. It's from their report uh, about uh, obesity in America. So basically, the, the the substance of the of the infographic was this: we've made this huge investment in medical care, and we talk about health, and that's what we talk. Even when we talk about medicine, like, well, what about healthcare? Like, folks, medicine ain't healthcare. That's medical treatment, right? Most of what happens with healthcare is your environment, your genetics, which you can't really control too much, but a big chunk of it is people's personal health behaviors. And we, we have just underinvested in the place where we have the biggest potential to help people get better. Now, you know, if you're watching this and you're in the San Diego Virtual Summit, you've already heard people talk about things like sleep and other things that are huge and crucial and awesome. And that's why you are ahead of the, ga the game if you're watching this conversation right now. But that's kind of where we need to go. We have overinvested in places where we have the least ability to influence, which is in the medical treatment sense, right? And so we've got to change that conversation, both interpersonally and nationally. Yeah, I love that. And so, so you're in the military where mm -hmm, the, yeah. the population is, um, I don't know if this is a fair thing, but definitely like the, their fitness levels are tracked much more regularly and all these things. Most do, definitely. You, do you see, um, and um, mm, between the civilian wor world and the military world, mm -hmm. do you see more money or more effort being invested in that idea of health as opposed to medicine? Um, and, and does it work? Yeah, so great point. I would say that we are we are definitely in the middle of an evolution that way uh, in the Department of Defense in the in the U.S. military. But some very encouraging things are ha are beginning to happen. One of which is uh, the U.S. Army, the largest service by far, has sorry I had to throw that one in there uh, has uh, rolled out this thing called the Holistic Health and Fitness Program, which is designed to do exactly what you're talking about. It's time to be. It's designed to proactively manage soldier health and, and readiness. But I would say generally, military people aren't different than civilian people. People don't stop being people when they put uniforms on. And so we have this sense that, that military people are, you know, uh, oftentimes unfairly to military, we kind of put them on some sort of un, undeserved or unfair, unhuman kind of pedestal about, about stuff. Uh, and I, like, I'm just a person like everybody else, right? And we're all kind of doing the best that we can with, with what we have. Awesome. Okay, so we're um, <laughs> so we still have a little bit more time for questions. If anyone is is interested um, in getting them in, to question at info or so sorry, question at San Diego Pain Summit dot com. Um, but you know, I'll ask what else now that you've watched. Um, I know that you didn't make your video too long ago, but is there anything you're like, oh, I wish oh, I would have maybe gotten that thanks. in there? Thanks. No, great, great question. You know, it, like if anything, I, you know, I, I'm, I think some days I try to cover too much at once, and I hope that this wasn't too much, too much for people. But um, like everybody's got what they want to emphasize, and for me, always, it's about practical application. If I'm giving you something that is not immediately practically applicable, I'm asking myself, what am I even doing here? Right. And so, like, I know, like, there can be some benefit in talking about, you know, the philosophy or the concepts behind something. And I'm not opposed to that at all. And I think that that can be healthy, but it's usually not useful. And what I want to give people is I want to give people things that are useful, that they can immediately implement, 
And so I'm, you know, I do hope we get some questions. And I, I put a, I put a tool up on the screen when I first started that I thought would, you know, maybe make people feel some kind of way and make them feel uncomfortable. That little hunk of metal that's kind of scary, right? And so we can definitely talk about that or about other things. That that was a deliberate effort to get people to have that hit, that sort of that adrenaline dump, that like, oh, oh my gosh, because that's what happens when difficult conversations happen. Sometimes you don't see them coming. Although when you understand this stuff, you get a little bit better, but sometimes you don't see it coming. And then when it happens, what skills and strategies do you have to manage what you're seeing, right? And so I'm hopeful that the systems that I, that I went through and the content that we reviewed today um, helps you feel more prepared to deal with difficulty when it happens. Yeah. And, you know, and I think that's another thing um, in our training, at least I'm speaking from a very like physio based background um, is, is, we don't really get much training to be prepared for the fact like yeah. there are really hard days and really hard yes. conversations to be yes. had. Um, so I really appreciate that, that concept of being prepared. Um, yeah. And the, what, if, if I have them talking, I can get them walking. Um, yeah. If I can I, make them talk, I can make them walk. That's yeah. the thing we say in self-defense, right? Cause that's what I want to do. I want to talk. I don't, I don't, I don't want to have the physical stuff. That's a failure in my mind, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that's my whole goal is to avoid that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. I want to resolve this other ways. And it's right. the same thing with patients, right? We want to be proactive with patients and colleagues about managing that stuff. And in, in medicine, in nursing, in PT, in massage, like we don't often as part of our training, we don't have a lot of deliberate, hey, here's how to have tough conversations with people, right? What happens is we put people in that situation, go, good luck, you know, <laughs> and then we give them some feedback about how they did, right? Instead of like giving people strategies to actually proactively manage that sort of thing. And that's really what, I, what I'm trying to do is to help is to help people um, be able to function better by giving them some of those practical uh, skills. Awesome. So we do, perfect timing, um, have uh, a follow-up um, from uh, the, the question that came in earlier. I'm the submitter of the malingering question. I wanted to make sure I emphasize that everything I put wasn't assumed, but admitted by the patient. Does this change your yeah. recommendations in any way? Nope, I appreciate your clarification. And I, I definitely appreciate the person who's who's putting that out. And I think that what I think what I'm picking up, which is implicit, is they're trying to to reassure me that they were not thinking negatively about the patient. This was something that the patient openly brought up to them. And ma'am, sir, I get it. And I, ha I, don't, I haven't assumed anything negative about you. But I have to tell you, um, none of that stuff matters. Right. Whether the patient admits it or not, whether I suspect it or not, it's irrelevant. That does not change my behavior and it doesn't change my responsibility either, right? And so kind of what, what animates me every day at work and in whatever environment I'm in is not like what, what I have to do or my task list or whatever. It's what my responsibilities to other people are and how I can meet my responsibilities to other people. And I have responsibilities to them. And what I have, the responsibilities I have for my patient is to do the absolute best I can do is to make my one variable, it's just one variable of clinical care, as good as it can possibly be. And we have either maximized that or we have not. And if we have, it's time to transition. Doesn't matter. Nothing else matters. Not the insurance money, not the whether or not we think they deserve it or they're making it up or whether or not they're here for social none of that stuff matters right if they came to me on day one says, you know um here's the deal like i don't really want to do therapy i'm just here for a social thing and i'm charity covered and i'm just here to say hi and, and meet people and have a cup of coffee and all that stuff and i'd be like oh great talk to me about what your goals are we try to work the therapy thing but once i get a sense that the therapy piece is maximized then it's time to move to self-management one visit, three visits, 10 visits, doesn't matter, right? It, that transition, that responsibility doesn't, doesn't change based on all those things. That's why I think even talking about that stuff, even thinking about it, just isn't useful. Awesome. <clears throat> I will also toss this one up here in our last minute. <laughs> Great prop on the gun. And I do need to apologize. Thanks. I'm supposed to make you like the only picture on there and that gun would have been yeah. way bigger if I would have done my job better. Do you want to see it again? Oh, here, wait, hold on, hold on. It's okay, it's okay. The big if one. If you want a screenshot, here's your chance, right? There we go. Just a tool 
nothing to be afraid of. But here's the deal. So when you get difficult conversations, you're going to feel something sudden and it's going to make you feel uncomfortable. And the question is, do you have the, the tools and strategies to manage what you're feeling and to move through the interaction, right? And so just, just like everything else, being prepared for something doesn't mean you seek it out. Love it. Um, and then, of course, we did get a bunch more questions, but we are also out of time and need to mosey on over to Zoom for the backstage okay. pass holders. But All so right. everyone who did get a question in, um, but we did not have time to address it. Jason did tell you how to find him online. So check him out on Facebook yeah. or Twitter or Instagram or TikTok or LinkedIn. Excellent. <laughs> um, thank you. <laughs> the TikTok surprised me. but Well I just, played, ma'am. Well played. I, have I, I want to be everywhere people are. I want to be everywhere people are. And if that's where they are, then that's where I want to be too. I love it. Okay. Well, the people, some people are going to be over on Zoom. I'll go open up that meeting. Everyone else, we will see you. Um, we will see you in a bit. <laughs>